Some pericyclic reactions are allowed and some are forbidden. And we're very interested in being able to predict whether a particular pericyclic reaction is allowed or forbidden or get as much information as we can about how it occurs from an orbital analysis. You may have previously encountered the Woodward-Hoffman rules. These provide a set of guidelines for allowed and forbidden pericyclic reactions based on relatively simple orbital analysis that could be done on the back of a napkin. And so we're going to look at that for the three different classes of pericyclic reactions in the remainder of this video. Let's start by thinking through cycloadditions and dividing up the cases into thermal and photochemical reactions. In the case of a thermal reaction, to use the frontier MO analysis approach to determine whether a cycloaddition is allowed or forbidden, we look at the HOMO of one molecule and the LUMO of the other, and it actually does not matter which one we look at the HOMO of and which one we look at the LUMO of, the conclusion will be the same regardless. And if we don't know what the HOMO and LUMO of these pi systems look like, we can use a tool like Hewless or a Huckel orbital calculation to obtain those very easily. And so the HOMO of, say, ethylene looks like this from above. I'm looking at two, two p orbitals in phase overlapping. The pi orbital would have an appearance like this with p orbitals in phase. The LUMO has the p orbitals out of phase. The thing we should notice here is that while we can get a bonding interaction between these two lobes, which have matching phase, we cannot get a bonding interaction at the same time between the other two lobes, which are necessarily opposite in phase. This allows us to conclude that the thermal 2 plus 2 cycloaddition is forbidden. For the photochemical case, the situation changes dramatically. With photo excitation, the former HOMO has become a LUMO, since a hole has opened up in the former HOMO and the former LUMO has become a HOMO. And so in the photochemical analysis, we don't look at the HOMO and LUMO, we look at either the HOMO and HOMO or the LUMO and LUMO. So let's just for the sake of argument, look at the two HOMOs of ethylene. And of course, you probably see where this is going. We absolutely can, since those orbitals have identical shapes, get in phase overlap at both ends of both pi systems at the same time. This means that this cycloaddition under photochemical conditions is allowed. In fact, it, it goes very rapidly. And so photo excitation is one of the only ways to get a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition to go via a concerted pericyclic mechanism. I'm just going to draw very quickly the analysis for the 4 plus 2 case and state while I'm drawing that the 4 plus 2 case is allowed thermally now and forbidden photochemically. The general rule we can pull from this is that th for thermal cycloadditions, the total number of pi electrons involved must be 4n plus 2 for allowed thermal cycloadditions. On the other hand, allowed photochemical cycloadditions have a total number of electrons that is a multiple of 4, or 4n. So 2 plus 2, 4 plus 4, 6 plus 6, 8 plus 8, etc. are all allowed photochemically, while the allowed cycloadditions for thermal reactions are 4 plus 2, 6 plus 4, any total number of pi electrons that is 4n plus 2. To analyze sigmatropic reactions, we again take a homo-lumo approach to the thermal case using the sigma bonds, homo or lumo, again it does not matter, alongside the pi systems LUMO or HOMO, the complementary frontier orbital overlapping with the sigma bond. And typically, to keep things simple, I just imagine thinking about the HOMO of the sigma bond and the LUMO of the adjacent pi system. And our goal here is not so much to determine allowed or forbidden, but to determine how the group needs to migrate across the pi system, whether it can move directly across staying on the same face of the pi system as it migrates, that's called superfacial migration, or whether it needs to cross over to the other side of the pi system, that's called anterofacial migration. So if we look, for example, first at the thermal case of the 1, 3 sigmatropic rearrangement, I'm actually going to redraw the molecule we have up here and now draw the sigma bonds HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital of the sigma bond, essentially the sigma bonding orbital, and the LUMO of the pi system. And we're going to do this 
in such a way that there is constructive overlap between the lobes of the homo and lumo where they intersect. In other words, at this point where the CH sigma bond overlaps with the pi system. The practical upshot of this is that I'm going to draw this lobe of the lumo of the pi system with the same phase as the adjacent sigma orbital with blue on top and red on bottom. But because I'm looking at the lumo of this two atom pi system, the atom next door has the opposite phase. There's a node between the nuclei, right? And notice that in order for there to be constructive overlap, this sigma bond lobe has to migrate to the other side of the pi system. In essence, the pi system has to wrap around the top of the sigma bond. This is what we call an interfacial arrangement with the H on the underside of the other side of the pi system. And of course, for a thermal 1,3, this is very, very difficult to achieve because of the geometric situation. And, and so in practice, this is forbidden. It can happen for longer rearrangements like the 1,7 where the pi system has room to kind of wrap around. When we do the same analysis in the photochemical case, now we don't look at homo-lumo overlap. We look at homo homo overlap because the pi system has been photo excited. So now its former homo is a lumo. So I've drawn the sigma homo of the CH sigma bond and I'm going to draw the homo now of the pi system, which is really a singly occupied molecular orbital in the excited state. And because we're looking at a homo here, the phases of the two p orbitals on each of the carbons match. And notice now that all the hydrogen has to do is migrate along the top face, stay on the same face as it moves in this sigmatropic rearrangement. This is called superfacial migration. Just to save us a bit of time, I'll leave it to you to do the analyses of the 1,5 sigmatropic rearrangement for the thermal and photochemical cases, keeping in mind that in the photochemical case, we still are looking at homo homo overlap or lumo lumo overlap to get the same conclusion in either case. And in the thermal case, we're looking at homo lumo overlap. The conclusion we come to is one that's analogous to the cycloaddition case. The selectivity or the, the geometric disposition of the rearrangement switches for 1,3 versus 1,5. So the thermal rearrangement is now suprafacial and the photochemical rearrangement is now anterofacial. And so again, the photochemical reactions have complementary selectivity to the thermal reactions. For electrocyclic ring opening and closing reactions, we're again interested in the geometry of the process. And in particular, what has to happen, for example, in the ring closing process, is that p orbitals that are originally parallel need to rotate into an alignment so that they're pointing at each other so that they can form the new sigma bonding orbital in the product. And this happens through a rotation process. And our question is, do the two orbitals, the two p orbitals on either end rotate in the same direction, so-called con-rotatory? For example, do they rotate like this? Or do they rotate in opposite directions? That's called disrotatory movement. One p orbital is moving in the opposite direction, say counterclockwise, while the other is moving clockwise. And again, this depends on the number of electrons involved in the electrocyclic ring opening or closing, and whether it's photochemical or thermal. And we'll say that for ring opening, ring opening has the same rotational selectivity as ring closing since they're the microscopic reverse of one another. And to do the analysis here, we look at orbital symmetry and how the homo of the reactant transforms into the homo of the product or lumo to lumo. In the photochemical case, we flip the script. We look at how the lumo of the reactant transforms into the homo of the product, for example. And so opposite selectivity is again going to be the name of the game here. So to briefly cover the thermal case, let's lay down the homo for a four atom pi system. And the thing we can see is that the top lobes have opposite face. So there's a bottom lobe on this other side that is filled in, and there's a bottom lobe here that is empty. And in order for these to overlap in phase, this orbital needs to rotate sort of up towards you, and this guy needs to rotate sort of down into the plane of the screen. These are the same direction of rotation. They're both moving in a clockwise direction if we're looking from this way. And so this is a con-rotatory situation. Both p orbitals are rotating in the same direction to form an in-phase sigma bonding orbital. 
And so the HOMO of the reactant transforms into the HOMO of the product, the sigma bonding orbital, through a con rotatory process. And just to really drive that home, the sigma bonding orbital of the product, of course, looks something like this. And we can see how those p orbitals rotated to generate this in a con rotatory way. In the photochemical case, now the LUMO of the pi system transforms into the HOMO of the product. And now we have the same phase on either end of the pi system, and so the p orbitals on either end are rotating in opposite directions, say this one clockwise and this one counterclockwise, to form the new sigma bond in phase. This is a disrotatory motion. Again, not surprising that photo excitation switches the sense of rotation in this process. And as you may have guessed, we're going to come to the opposite set of conclusions for the 6 pi ERC case. The thermal reactions are disrotatory, and the photochemical reactions are con-rotatory. And there are profound implications here for the stereochemistry, by the way, right? Since con-rotatory and disrotatory motions would generate diastereomers of this product with two new stereocenters. And so we can change the stereochemical selectivity of these reactions just by moving from a thermal to a photochemical mode.